So good evening, everyone, and welcome. I think we will go ahead and start just because it's after seven and we have a um, robust conversation planned for uh, within an hour. Um, I am happy to see all of you here tonight. I am Fatima Fanusi, the program director for the Justice Leaders Program. And I'd like to welcome you all to Walking the Justice Talk, a panel exploring economic justice with four Baltimore activists and nonprofit leaders whose discussion tonight here will help to illustrate, we hope, why thinking interreligiously matters, especially around an issue as important as economic justice. So our format for tonight is pretty simple. Our panelists will be responding to four questions in a conversation with each other and me around economic justice and their interreligious learning. We invite you to submit questions as they come up in the chat as the uh, panel and the evening proceeds. We won't answer the questions right away. What we'll do is about 10 to 15 minutes before we conclude our panel, we will uh, take questions from the audience and present those questions to our panelists to answer. Our four panelists were uh, recently fellows in the 2021 cohort of the ICJS's Justice Leaders Fellowship Program. And they each have incredibly rich backgrounds, proven track records of commitment to the communities in which they work and lead. So I am excited to take this time now to briefly introduce them to you before we begin our program. So we have Marian, Miriam Avins, Avins, who is co-chair of Baltimore City's Commission on Sustainability. And uh, she oversees the creation and implementation of Baltimore Sustainability Plan. In 2007, Miriam founded Baltimore Green Spaces, which is a land trust that has preserved 15 community managed gardens, forest patches and open spaces throughout the city. She also served as its executive director until 2019. And Miriam enjoys gardening, making music and creating community. Next, we have Farah Shakur Bridges, who is the founder of 4B4 Education Incorporated. And Farah has a longstanding history of demonstrating a relentless commitment to the community, particularly in the areas of education, mental health, and fundraising. She creates spaces for youth to be valued and heard. Farah is also co-founder of the Foundation for Is Islamic Education, which raises funds for research and the establishment of quality educational institutions that are rooted in Islamic ethics. She's a former teacher at Clara Muhammad School, a certified trainer and a consultant in early learning centers and staff development. And in this role, Farah has helped dozens of women with little preparation to obtain the child development associate credential, preparing them to facilitate quality early learning experiences for children while gaining stability for their own families. Farah has also served as development officer and community relations director in both the public and the private sectors. In these roles, she has raised millions of dollars for educational and human service programs, um, services programs in the DC metropolitan area while fostering important community and political relationships. Professionally, Farah is an analyst within local government and is known for her ability to solve complex problems facilitate organizational change, and build relationships with diverse groups of stakeholders. She and her husband provide services to the interfaith community, to young people, and to the community at large through 4B4 Education Incorporated, which also provides enriching educational and cultural experience to the youth, their families, and their larger communities. Farah is the current president of the International League of Muslim Women of the nation's capital, and in her spare time, she's a fabric artist and a crafter who creates original cultural pieces, a comedic writer and performer, hopefully we'll see some of that wit tonight, and an event organizer and host. Farah hopes to continue to serve her family and her community and looks forward to helping build premier, robust institutions 
dedicated to the service of all humanity. Then we have Jessica Claytman, who's a board member for Let's Thrive Baltimore. And Jessica is also the community affairs director for the chair of the Baltimore County Council. Jessica is a community activist, a justice advocate, a yoga and meditation teacher, a social worker, and a mother. And she was born and raised right here in Baltimore, where she attended Baltimore City Public Schools. Uh, currently, Jessica steers, serves on the steering committee of Baltimore Women United and is the chair of the Baltimore Women United for Action PAC. Um, as, uh, in this capacity, she has co-planned multiple citywide events, including the Baltimore Women's Marches, Immigrant Solidarity Rallies, and the Vigil and Call to Action in honor of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, Jessica uh, also is a 500 hour certified yoga teacher who teaches yoga and meditation in her community around the city and online. She uses the practices of yoga and meditation to instill skills for releasing stress and promoting wellness and compassion in students, clients, and community members. And then finally, we have Leon F. Pinkett III. Leon was born and raised in Baltimore, Maryland, where he has dedicated the past 23 years to serving communities throughout the city, especially those in West Baltimore. Throughout his extensive career as a public servant in Baltimore City, Leon has proven experience in strengthening communities, community organizing, and commercial development in urban centers. Um, he was also sworn in as a member of the Baltimore City Council, representing the 7th District in 2016. On the council, Councilman Pinkett served as the vice chair of both the Budget and Appropriations Committee and the Taxation, Finance, and Economic Development Committee. In addition, he was a member of the Judiciary and Legislative Investigations Committee, the Land Use and Transportation Committee, the Education and Youth Committee, and the Public Safe Com Safety Committee. Prior to being elected to the city council, Mr. Pinkett served three years as the assistant deputy mayor for the Office of Economic and Neighborhood Development, where he shared oversight of several key city agencies with a focus on developing revitalization efforts to strengthen and support communities throughout Baltimore. So as you can see, all of our uh, panel members have extensive backgrounds of serving the communities in which they live and lead. And I would like you to join me in welcoming them tonight. And uh, without further ado, we'll, we'll start our program. Thank you. So um, our first question for the evening is, um, and the way we'll do it, um, panelists, you can feel free to jump in and answer the question yourself. Just unmute yourselves. As a matter of fact, all four of you might want to unmute yourselves now and um, make sure everyone gets a turn to answer the question. Our first question is, what constitutes for you, what constitutes an economically just society? So I can just go, I have Farah, Leon, Miriam, and Jessica in that order on my screen. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, so, and, and I'm honored to be here with everybody today and with this awesome panel and with this organization. Um, so economic justice in a just society, um, for Muslims, we really look towards people's fair access to resources and to the ability to earn. Um, we do have charitable pursuits in Islam. However, uh, it is better to be able to earn. So with economic justice, you have to make the, the playing field so that it is um, equitable for everyone. Um, and, it, and also in thinking about economic justice, we're not, segregated into little pockets of our lives. We, have, we are holistic people and we're holistic communities. So economic justice is tied to justice in other areas of our lives and of our communities as well. And that involves 
trauma and healing from trauma and, and the emotional and spiritual growth that is required of us as, uh, as a society um, so that people can be in the space where even if you do earn, then you're earning and you realize that you're interdependent with everybody else and your earnings matter for you individually, your family and your community. Uh, thanks, Farah. Uh, Leon, for you, what um, constitutes an economically just society? So I, I think that Farah hit on so many of the points. Um, it, it's funny, when I was thinking about the answer to this, I felt like the, the Lay's commercial, you can't just pick one. <laughs> the, the, there's so many um, different you know, aspects of what would make up a, a just or economically just society. But um, Farah mentioned the, the access and opportunity. And so I, I wanna just dovetail off of that for a minute because oftentimes we talk about opportunity and we talk about access, but then the resources that we make available to opportunity and access don't align with what we say that we, that we are providing and, and hope that people would be able to take advantage of. And so we, we've got to um, institute systems and policies that um, make certain that uh, the resources are there are in, in, in alignment to really allow for people to um, be empowered um, for economic justice in their community. Um, it, take, for example, it, it's, if it, it would be one thing to say that we, you know, that we've created jobs in a certain industry. And so we, prepare, we provide training for an individual so that they could take advantage of that, those employment opportunities. But then if we don't acknowledge the fact that that, that individual needs to have some income while they're training, or that they might need transportation while they're training or daycare or housing assistance or these other elements that even allow for them to be able to take advantage of that, then are our resources really aligning with opportunity and access? And so, um, and too often that's the case. We, we say that we've created this opportunity for you, but then don't provide the resources that really allow for you to access it. And so part of a, a just, you know, economically just society is one that also aligns everybody's resources with um, the justice that we say that we want for all of our all of our residents and citizens. Thank you, Leon. And so, Miriam, I'll turn that same question over to you. What constitutes an economically just society? Well, <laughs> you know, of course, Leon's right. It's not just one thing. It's a whole. It's all the potato chips. Um, a piece of it that has really been of interest to me for a long time is like people need to be producing for themselves, earning for themselves, but also as a community, we need to be looking at how do we provide for all of us. And so the mutual help aspect of, of, of an economy is because the economy is just how we meet our material needs within our society and a society that's all about just me, 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 without understanding the web of network of relationships we're with is pretty empty. And an economy that works that way, well, we see what that is like in many ways. Um, so that, that's a piece of it. I think also valuing, while, while in Baltimore, clearly we need more people with more income um, to meet our basic needs, to also really value the unpaid work that people do in their households and that they do in their communities and to see that as part of sustaining ourselves, um, I think is of real value in creating more humanity. And I think the other piece for me is trying to keep things local, um, trying to build our local businesses, find ways to encourage local investment in businesses so that more businesses can get access to capital. So those are some of the things that are dear to my heart. All right, I'll just jump right in. And uh, my pandemic puppy is, is quiet right now, but so, sometimes I have to be on mute. So I apologize for that. Um, yeah, I'm talking about you. Um, I'll, I'll just start by saying ditto to everything that was said. So I don't have to repeat those things. And you can know that I think them. Um, one of the things that we learned about in the uh, Justice Leaders Fellowship on Economic Justice is about the value of self-actualization in work so that economic justice isn't, is 
of course, foundational that everyone has what they need, but also that you get something from your work ideally more than just having what you need to put food on the table so that your whole, uh, I think Miriam mentioned the whole humanity, but like your whole self can come through in your work. And of course, not every job can be that way, but we learn from the religious faiths that there is an important focus on that, on being able to, yes, value all roles, but also have our work be something that has meaning to us um, in our human lives. Now you heard uh, Fatima describe me as not a social worker, an activist, and also a yoga and meditation teacher. And that is so important from that perspective as well, um, that we don't approach any anything in our lives as just one thing. We're all complete people. So we are parents and children and workers and consumers of other work products and so much more. So how can we create a society, an economically just society recognizes that we are all those things. Um, one thing we, we saw an incredible picture one day when we were, uh, when our Muslim scholar Zainab was speaking to us, she showed us a picture of people praying on the street in the middle of a work day, just leaving their jobs in the middle of the day to pray because prayer is required at that moment. And an economically just society allows people to be a religious human, a whole human, to have their needs met on all levels and not just prioritizing the, um, basically the capitalist economic growth. Last night, there was a rally in Annapolis for paid family and medical leave where we asked for this right to be human beings, this right to have children, to have babies and stay home with them, this right to have elder parents who need our help, the right to be injured or sick and still be able to support our families and not have to choose between them, between our income and our, our caregiving needs for ourselves or for others. And that's economic justice too, where we don't have to feel jeopardized in our work when the, all the other things that make us human beings come up. Yeah, thank you, Jessica. So I don't know if anyone wants to on the panel respond to anything that Jessica says, but just before we move on to the next question, I want to just maybe go over. So what we're saying is an economically just society really requ requires mutual dependency and, you know, making sure that people have dignity in the work that they do and that they are have the provisions to be whole people and in, in, in all of the different roles that, roles that that might um, consist of as family members in their larger communities, et cetera. Um, yeah, so That's yeah. I can chime in too. One thing I, that um, we've kind of alluded to, but I think should be stated explicitly is also that we are God's stewards on yeah. this earth and for, and for each other. Um, so when we view it in that way, we don't view ourselves, speaking to Jessica's point, as just rugged consumers. We view ourselves as protectors, maintainers, and vice gerents of, of this earth and of the resources and the people and the animals and everything around us. And that's a part of economic justice, that having that perspective as well. Tara, I'm in love with your phrase, rugged consumers. <laughs> Yes. And then the economically just world you're painting in there becomes much more environmentally just too, because if we remember that we're stewards of this earth, then we're gonna take care of that. That's right. Yeah. And I guess the last thing I'll say before we move on to the next question is I love that you brought up trauma because um, that's recognizing that eat for people to be resilient and to continue to, um, to, to pursue and, and even be able to have ec economic um, independence or justice, they have to take care of their whole selves, including their mental well being. And that's something that's becoming um, increasingly, you know, a larger problem and related to, you know, so many that we see without homes and, and, and a variety of other issues that are plaguing our cities, not just here in Baltimore, but across the country. So I really appreciate the, that in-depth response that, that you all have given. Um, uh, You're going to ask us next about what what's kind of getting in the way, because I want to talk a lot more about it. Yes, yes, exactly. Actually, 
not only was I going to ask you what was getting in the way, but I was going to remind you of what one of your fellow justice leaders, I remember during the course of our fellowship, one of uh, the justice fellows actually had a moment of frustration where he said, um, basically all these religions are saying the same things and they're saying good things, but so then why do we still have so much you know, economic injustice? And there was a lot of frustration behind his um, comment. And so that you know, leads us right to our second question, which is what, what are some of the most pressing barriers? I mean, what you're talking about sounds ideal and wonderful, but what are some of the most pressing barriers uh, preventing uh, or issues surrounding economic injustice in Baltimore today? If each of you could speak about that in no particular order, um, next. Yeah, if, if I can um, jump in and then I'm going to punt to Jessica, um, because I mean, you just mentioned trauma and, and trauma is not just um, uh, something that in, potentially impacts us individually. Trauma can impact the community. And, and when we're talking about, you know, you know, economic justice, um, it requires that there, that a community does not have a sense that their their destiny or their fate is already sealed, that they've pretty much given up and that there's no hope. And if we would be honest, that there are many families, many communities that um, can't even consider the concept of an economic just society. Um, um, my colleagues uh, laughed at me when I shared with them a, a story of a friend of mine who um, had um, had this had the dog and they used to um, keep the dog in a particular room of the house and they would put up a baby gate to keep the dog in the house. And they, they kept the dog in the room so long that at some point they stopped really putting the gate up. They just laid the gate next to the door and the dog was just so accustomed to bumping up against this gate over and over and over and never being able to get out of that space that it just stopped trying. And I'm not comparing families or communities to this dog, but we have whole communities of people that are tired and frustrated of bumping up against our systems, bumping up against our policies, bumping up against the lack of resources, but still hearing people say, that, but there's hope and there's opportunity and there's access to the point where many have given up despite all of our efforts of so many great organizations. And so um, we, we do have to deal with trauma and I kicked the Jessica. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Thank you, Leon. And thank you for everything you said. And, um, you know, I know you said, you know, we're not comparing our, our family to Doug, but that same, um, that same uh, reaction goes on deep within us. So that our traumas are not surface deep and they don't just come from our own experiences. They are generational. And when you have communities like African-Americans and um, Jewish uh people in the United States that have had, and many, many others, Muslim communities that have had trauma inflicted upon them as peoples over many years, you get into two habits, um, habits of behavior. This incredible book, I can't ever talk to people without bringing books to, to hold up. So this amazing book called My Grandmother's Hands talks about this, about how this intergenerational trauma is held in our bodies so that when something happens, we have a physical response, which then impacts how we behave. Oh, there goes that dog. Um, speaking of dog, I obviously did not train my dog that well, but does anybody here know um, a motivational speaker um, and spiritual leader called Ayanla Van Zant? Has anybody heard of her? Yes. Yeah, I see some people nodding. So she tells the story of how she, well, she went from being, um, having a difficult childhood, being a mother on welfare herself to being a multimillionaire and, and world famous. Um, but she talks about a period when she had started to make money. She was making a million dollars a year, but she was constantly broke, like constantly on the verge of having her electricity shut off, um, her water shut off, losing her car, losing her phone because she was so habituated to things that told her like, you can't get money unless you don't have any money. 
because she had been raised in that pattern to believe that. So I'm not by any means saying that this is a uh, individual responsibility. What I'm saying is we have a communal responsibility. So yes, people bump up against systems, but then there are incredible organizations like my colleagues and probably all of you here that are trying to offer opportunities, but we do not help people deal with the things that prevent them from making the most of their opportunities. So then, you know, if every time you go over a pothole, you think you're going to get a flat tire, your heart starts to race, you start getting into a panic response. When you're on the street and there's violence on the street, your heart starts to race, you get into a panic response and you go into your fight or flight or flee. And you don't have the opportunity to take advantage of whatever resources there might be because you're just not in a position to do it. So the point of all this being, we need to heal some this intergenerational trauma. We need to be working on this in order to have any semblance of, of justice in our society. Mm -hmm. If I can jump in now, thank you both, um, Leon and Jessica for, for mentioning trauma. Um, that's actually my area of focus for my doctoral program is working with women who have experienced kind of these, this, these intersectionalities of challenging situations, economics being one of them, but there's, there's race, there's gender, there's religion, all of those factors. Um, and Jessica, I'm so glad you brought up books because I love books too. Um, you, you brought up the book that outlines trauma. There's another book by Bessel van der Kolk. He's kind of the father of trauma response and it's called The Body Keeps the Score. Thank you, you've got it right there. So that book actually is it, kind of a dense read in some regards, but it actually helps you to self-regulate. Now, in response to trauma and traumatic events. Now I wanna, I wanna acknowledge the role of your interior movements, your internal systems, but we also have an external system that's really messed up too. So you, so like you mentioned, Jessica, the work that you do on yourself, that's how you prevent yourself. I'm looking, I don't have a remote control, but my grandmother used to say, don't let anybody put you on remote control. That's how you stay off of remote control from all the triggers you talked about. But then beyond that, you still might live in an in a, um, environment where you don't have those opportunities. And so I was, um, I, I'm on social media more than I probably should be sometimes, but uh, I was on social media and there was a comedian talking, it was a comedic guy, I don't know if he's actually a comedian, but he was talking about the CIAA tournament that's occurring in Baltimore, the basketball tournament. And um, he, in a humorous way, he, he had a picture of the of Baltimore and he drew a, a line lines of demarcation around the area where anybody coming as a tourist to Baltimore, they should not go beyond those lines. And he, you know, he had all these funny things to say about it, but it was sad, really at the core of it. It's sad that you can go one block over and you are not safe. And the people who live there are not safe because the economic and the societal opportunities don't exist for them. But you can bring all this money into the city for these tournaments and these festivals and all these other things, but you still don't have a just society. So, so, the, another, so we talked about the barriers in, inside of ourselves. <clears throat> the barriers outside of ourselves are gentrification. <laughs> they are lack of, of um, educational opportunities that can and training opportunities that can lead to having good jobs as Leon uh, mentioned and, and having careers and also not thinking outside of the job mentality you know many people they don't want a traditional job they that's not suited for them small businesses they actually make the world go round you know so we really should be also encouraging entrepreneurship more um, and that's my two cents. Sorry, uh, Miriam, it's your turn now. <laughs> yeah, no, that really says it all. It's such a potent brew, right? Because on the one hand, we have a system that's really not set up for success for a lot of people. And then we have people who have been conditioned not to feel they're set up for success themselves. And that's a lot to fight against, no matter what angle you come at it. 
And then we have plenty of people who grow up in situations where that's a danger and, and, and find a way. Um, but it's a lot to fight against. I think a lot of us are, a lot of people are swimming upstream and heaven knows our systems need to do a little swimming upstream where it's not just, you know, how we're screwed up today. It's, it's the weight of history on us. And so what is the creativity that, you know, there's no silver bullet. So what is the so many different approaches that, that nibble away in different places and try to create virtuous cycles where we have vicious cycles? I think that mentioning the weight of history is so important. I mean, we're living in a country now that was set up on systems that favor some and disfavor others. And so um, that is weighty. And I think one of the ways that we can start to really um, combat that is for, I saw a little question in the chat, I didn't read the whole thing about education, is that making sure that people know and understand that, you know, how, how we, how this country was set up to be, how this city was set up to be. You know, everyone here probably knows and understands that, but a lot of people don't know. They don't understand how systems were arranged very specifically to favor or, or um, or not to favor certain populations. Yeah, I, I think that I think we've got to be um, extremely honest with the fact that the systems oper the systems that were in place and some that are still in place operated and are operating exactly how they were designed to operate, and they were they were created so that um, a, a certain segment of the population would be um, uh, more benefited than others. And, and it was done intentionally. And so we will have to, it will, if we want, truly want an economically just society, society, we will have to be as intentional as those were in the past when they set up those systems that we all know are broken. And if we are not willing to be as just as determined as you know, these systems that we talk about and the individuals who set them up, then we will never have an economically just society. Um, it, it will require for us to be as intentional, as determined, as committed uh, to making certain that, you know, you know, equity is just not the common word of the day, but it is the reality for everyone. And it sounds like reparations. Sorry, go ahead. I said, that sounds like you're talking about reparations, Leon. If, if that's, I mean, it could be reparations. I mean, I don't I don't know if it's any one, you know, you know, one thing, um, but that definitely could be a part of the equation. Thank you. Yeah. And I was just chiming in to say that um, when we talk about, you know, what, what we're willing to sacrifice, I asked that question once in a, in a uh, mixed race, mixed gender group, and it seems like all of the people of color they knew what they could sacrifice and what they have sacrificed. But unfortunately, it seemed like a lot of uh, white Americans had never thought about that question. What am I willing to sacrifice? What am I willing to give up? What am I willing to do to take a stand? And it's gonna really take all of us. It's, it's not just gonna be limited to the, um, those who are in more oppressed or subdued positions. Um, because as we've all been talking about, there's already so much stress and burden there that has, has that people have endured through generations and generations and generations and people get tired, you know, so we have to work together. Can, can I just say something else? Um, and it, it, it's, it's a conversation that kind of, um, um, kind of sets me off when we talk about Baltimore. And, and um, this is nothing against Miriam's statement as it relates to reparations. But when I think about reparations and I think about Baltimore, here we have a city that's majority black with uh, elected leadership that's majority black. Um, the black leadership in Baltimore could literally do whatever it wanted to do legally with a three plus billion dollar budget. I mean, the individuals who are at some point, black people in those positions will have to recognize that you are the reparations that our people need. You are sitting in those positions 
and you have the authority. I mean, you literally have the majority of the city council. There's not a piece of legislation that you can't pass. You literally are in the mayor's office making the budget. I mean, you could, you could change East and West Baltimore overnight. And now you have $640 million you know, of recovery funds. You could literally change generations of black children. And we're talking about reparations as, as a legal. It's, it's reparations for Baltimore is gonna to have to be a change of the heart. Mm. Mm. We, we, while we, while I do want us to move to the next question, Leon, I am so happy that you said that. I was like itching to get in there, but you, you said that and that's wonderful. And it also reminds me of your little dog, the dog there as well, because I often think about, I mean, with both of my parents being educators, I always think about the children. And it's one thing for, you know, a 42 year old or a 70 year old to think, you know, I'm gonna stand on the same corner and whatever, and, and, and you know, the system's against me. But what about when six and seven and eight and nine and 10 year olds, you know? And so it, it, I, I think about that strike, like for, the, for them not to have, to not to necessarily have butted their head against that wall, but to have been told that the wall is there, you know? So I love that you're pointing to the fact that, um, and Farah, the thing I was going to say when you were talking about, uh, we, we can talk about the race and we, we have to, but we also have to recognize the, the, the mental perspectives and that those can, that, that the, that the, um, Mentality can belong to anyone, regardless of their skin color. We have people who don't want anything to do with poor people because that's not their problem. And because they're getting theirs, you know, across, you know, ethnic, racial, gender, et cetera. So I, I think what you said at the end of your statement, Leon, really hits that nail on the head. We, we or maybe it was Farah, but that change of heart. And um, that leads us to our next question, which, um, uh, gets to um, some of the exact, some of the specific things that we learned about with um, the ICJS uh, scholars, um, uh, uh, Ben and Matt and, and Zaina. Bled gave us some uh, wonderful um, presentations over the course of the past year. And what I would like to ask each of you to reflect a little bit on now and share with um, our audience tonight is, is what wisdom and or insights do our religious texts and traditions offer for grappling with economic justice today? And um, you can pull from your own religious background and experience and or you can also pull from some of the, the rich diversity of traditions and, and, and teachings that we were privy to with our scholars here at ICJS. Would anyone love to take a stab? And I know some of you have mentioned some of this already in talking, but now's the time to kind of elaborate on some of those concepts. I know Farah dropped the word Khalifa, but people may not even know what that means and, and how it relates to economic justice. So whoever would like to start first, please um, you know, take a, take a stab at that question. I'll clarify Khalifa. Khalifa is the stewards or the sometimes translated as vice gerents, the, the, those who uh, are entrusted with what we call an amana, a trust to protect and preserve what Allah, the creator, God has given us. And so, um, you know, at this point, I'll just also mention that and reiterate, I, I think I said this earlier, but just that people have the ability to earn and to maximize their potential and their capacity. And we've, all, in all the, the discussion we've had thus far, we're talking about this is like a dream deferred. This is a, these, this is muted potential. How can we unlock that potential for people? I think that uh, one of the, one of the things that we we're all struck by is how much in common um, each of our our faiths were when it was talking about um, not just work, um, but yes, work and the, and the value of work, the sanctity of work, and even the holiness of work. So we talk about you know God took six great days to create the world and then rest on the seventh day, that's six days of holy work. So 
work is meant to be something um, special for all of us. But in addition, I think we found that our face had in common our communal responsibility towards each other. Um, that and not in a hierarchical, I have and you don't have, so I'm giving to you way, but in a way that we all belong here and we all matter. So what do we each contribute to um, making a functioning society and community together? And I was, I was really struck. I, was, I came to this fellowship expecting to hear all about our differences and really did learn. I felt a lot more about our, our similarities and where our value, from which our values stem. One of the um, really beautiful things for me, and wow, my brain is going bonkers right now. Um, I'm sorry, you'll have to come back to me. I had a thought and it just There's totally something beautiful. Okay. I'll, I'll jump in and then you can come right back in. Thanks. The, um, I, I think one of the things that resonated with me and, and, and both Farah and Jessica already alluded to it was, you know, when you think about the Khalifa and the fact that there is, you know, justice demands that, um, that, that we create opportunities for uh, people to be able to, to either work or to be able to provide for themselves. And, it, and it's not that ju justice doesn't suggest it. Um, justice doesn't think that it would be a nice thing to do. Justice demands that we create these opportunities. Mm -hmm. and, and that it's not just, you know, in the Islamic faith, but just to, to think about even in Judaism, how sacred work is and how the connection between work and God. Um, I, I know that, and I don't know if it was my phrase, but I just coined it, a, a phrase called workship. Like you, you can't even worship God properly outside of your ability to work. And when we don't allow for people to work, we, we, we deny them so much, so many things. We deny them of resources. We deny them of livelihood. We deny them to, to provide for their families. But we also deny them um, a, a vehicle or a venue by which they can um, relate and to worship God. And I don't know if people realize how serious work is and, and making work opportunities and, and opportunities for people to provide for themselves is. It, it is beyond just a natural relationship. It goes into the spiritual. And even when we think of non-work, it takes work to not work too. <laughs> you know, if you're going to survive, it takes work to do that. So how do you transfer that energy into a means that is beneficial for the individual and the society. And that's where we get into that internal work that Jessica was talking about too, because you know, if your mindset doesn't permit you to sell drugs or murder or do these other things that are deplorable to fellow human beings, you won't do them. Or if your mindset doesn't permit you to be in a position of power and you economically oppress others, then your work will entail making sure that others have what they need as well in terms of opportunity. Um, I wanted to point out something we learned in class too. I was looking at my notes because um, it was uh, Matthew uh, when he talked about the Christian view of economic justice. And what one thing that struck me from what he said was uh, talking about how if you, even if you're in a position where you seem to have limited power, you can always do something. You know, he talked about um, Paul and he talked about writing these letters to, to influential people. And um, I think that that's what we, that's a part of a mindset as well that we were talking about. You know, even if you only have the ability to write a letter, you can do that. You know, wherever you are, whatever your social location is, you can offer something to the world um, in terms of economic justice, but in terms of all these other aspects of life that we talked about too. Yeah. And, and that connects to what I was trying to say before, which is I was really struck in, in the Jewish teachings on the requirement to share when it doesn't hurt you. Right. If somebody needs what you got and it doesn't hurt you to give it away, that's a requirement. It's not a nice thing. Um, so building the community through, I mean, if you want to to put it in like economist terms, maximizing utility for a resource or just thinking about the common good and mutual aid. Mm. 
I'm really struck by what, um, first of all, I, I love that Miriam, thanks for restating that because I couldn't remember how that was supposed to be stated, but yes, it's, it's, your, it's your obligation. Um, but also to what Farah said about, you know, figuring out what you can do and doing it. Um, it reminds me of a Jewish teaching that you may have heard quoted all over the place, basically saying like, you don't, it's not your obligation to complete the work, but neither are you free to desist from it or, or to not try. And I, I feel like that's something we, we learned carries across all of the faiths. Um, today, I visited what I thought was going to be a church in Security Square Mall called Set the Captives Free with an amazing pastor. She said, she was asked how many people are in this congregation. She's like, I don't know, because I stopped counting at 3,000. This is the influence of this community. But I, I say I thought it was going to be a church because that's what I believed that I was visiting. But what it is, is um, a community outreach center extraordinaire where, yes, on Sundays there is worship, but there is also um, child care, job training, activity for youth, a center that people can stay in when the temperatures are freezing, um, food resources, work training, all the resources. So that I really thought a lot about how the it was comes from a religious foundation. That's how they draw people there. Come here and worship with us. But there's a recognition that there's a whole community um, of need and opportunity. So this religious stuff, like if, if you're, you're interested in it, you're going to buy into it, is not a once a week thing, right? This is a, you know, seven days a week of work or, or thought or belief. Um, and I think actually, by the way, that we had some people in our fellowship who are atheists. So that goes beyond religious teachings also into the common values that, that we can share that may come sourced from religion and may come from other places. Mm -hmm. And also, thank you for that, because I wanted to also say, um, when you were talking about not you and Miriam about um, giving as an obligation, uh, as Muslims, we cannot just believe. Belief alone is not enough. Mm -hmm. So many times in the Quran, it says, for those who do, who have faith and do good works. Yeah. So they yeah. go hand in hand. And I, you can't become... Um, so holy that you only pray all day, nor can you forget to pray and go to work all day. And that Jessica, you brought up the, the picture of the, the people stopping in the middle of the work day to pray. So that is an obligation on Muslims to do good works as well. So thank you so much. We're, um, I am enjoying this conversation. I just want to move us to our final question. Um, and then we'll try to open the, the floor quickly. I hope we have time for at least one or two questions from uh, you, the audience. And that is, um, and I know this is a work in progress, but that final question is um, when I think about the title of um, Walking the, the Justice Talk, um, how are you bringing your own interreligious learning your own, you know, religious background and your and your own understanding um, to the work that you do around economic justice and economic um, empowerment. And we've already heard your your bios that you you all have extensive work and in leading um, communities that you're part of. So if you could just take a moment or two to you know uh, answer that question, each of you, and then we'll open the floor for some questions. I know this is the hard one. <laughs> so I guess I'd say for me, um, I'm a bit of an introvert and I find it really easy not to want to, not to feel comfortable engaging with people necessarily. And this fellowship was so amazing in teaching me how thoughtful um, and how beautiful the insights are from other religions and how not just the speakers who told us about it, but the other people of those religions, how they, their twists on it, their, their thoughts. And so it was a ginormous um, encouragement to my curiosity. And I also, to, to feel more encouraged and engaging in conversations with people and finding the commonalities, because there is an awful lot. Um, 
And, and also I think, you know, when people talk about religion, that's in the religious settings is where people are more comfortable talking about values very frequently than, you know, say in a workplace. So it's an in. Um, and then for me, the question is, well, not everyone considers themselves religious. How do you invite that values oriented conversation elsewhere? Um, but it was an enormous encouragement to me and I'm very grateful for it. Yeah, I think that, uh, go, go ahead, Farah. I was just gonna add that um, I got actionable steps from this fellowship and from learning from all of my peers. Um, a lot of times I've been involved with interfaith pursuits that, you know, they were more like feel good moments. You know, they were, you know, we share what, what do you think about this topic? And this is what I think about this topic from a religious perspective, but we didn't talk about now, how can we work together to make the world better? You know, outside of our internal thoughts and beliefs. And what I got from this interreligious learning was that there are actionable things that we can do. We've already established that we have common core values. Now, what, these are the steps we can take to implement those values so that they show up in Baltimore and in the world. Yeah, I, I think before um, the study, um, I, I, I just didn't know um, much about, you know, the, the other faiths and, and, and their beliefs. And as a result, I, I was um, operating under the perception that I had to, you know, almost disrobe my, my beliefs in order to work with someone else. And, and what I came to discover is all of the intersections between what we, what we all believe, especially as it relates to economic and, and, uh, justice. And if I be honest, it's now, um, you know, I guess, um, given, given the work, the opportunities that I have when I do work with others of a different faith, it's kind of energized that because now I know the intersections, now I know the commonalities and how we, be, how we believe um, and it, it really makes the work even more meaningful because we don't have to be less of what we are, what we believe in order to work together. Because the, the things that we agree on um, related to justice and equality and, and caring for, you know, um, for people. And, and you know, if we could somehow um, invigorate a whole community of believers in this city to understand that you know, the, the destiny of Baltimore is, is, is waiting for us all to come together around the, the topics that we can work together on and, and do it with, with great passion. Um, we can make some great changes in the city. Yeah. Keep following that. <clears throat> That's so good, Leon. So, I, I mean, I would just leave it with, yes, that. Um, but also, you know, as a myself, a religious minority, I have often felt like, you know, I have to kind of figure out what's going on in, in any environment. And I am so deeply grateful for this opportunity to have learned from the very text and from um, experts and scholars and from our own community of fellows so that um, it really has in increased my, my own personal understanding and also um, the commonalities we've all talked about um, have for me increased my ability to feel that, that I have a place um, in, the, in the work that, that I think everyone comes to this fellowship wanting to do. And then of course we all have each other now, which is so exceptionally amazing. Um, and I think that the benefits of that and the interreligious work and learning we've done together uh, have barely been discovered this, this close to finishing our fellowship and uh, hopefully they will uh, flourish as Frida wrote in the chat in, in many years to come. Yeah. Thank you. And I think we're going to just stick one question in. We have one question and hopefully that might be all we have time to ask. And um, after that question is answered, um, we I think Christine will drop a quick survey into the chat. 
Um, but that question for anyone who would like to answer it um, here on the panel is um, was submitted by, I think, Maureen. And it is one of the prerequisites of an economically just society is an understanding of systematic political and economic policies that have long that have long established barriers to economic opportunity or justice. Where might does this education fit into your approach to establishing justice? I don't wanna pick on anyone. If somebody has an answer to that, I know Farah, you've done a lot of work with education, but um, that question is, is um, open to everyone. Farah, Leon, Jessica, and uh, Miriam. Well, yeah. from a, oh, go ahead, Farah. No, you oh. go right ahead. And we have another question. Yes. Um, yeah. On the Sustainability Commission, um, Avis Ransom, who was such an important voice in Baltimore, basically, when we started looking at things um, on the commission saying we want to have a racial equity lens on everything and, and, and saying to ourselves, and what does that mean? Avis Ransom taught us it means always looking at the history. How did we get here? Um, it isn't something we do once in school and we're done with. It means always going back and finding out what are the communities concerned about and why, how does it come to pass? So that's just always a key. Mm -hmm. And uh, the second question is, um, and then after this, hopefully we can um, you go toward the, uh, the uh, survey. Um, it seems as if values oriented toward holistic human flourishing are missing in the current conversation about addressing the ills of our society. Are we willing to participate in a movement toward, towards this type of change? Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, that's a large part, I think, what we have been talking about today, tonight. And I think when you say values, it's important to, you know, um, we if we uh, are following, you know, what's going on in our society and our, in our political system, there are groups that claim to be values based, but those values are destruction. Those values are hoarding, you know hoarding of resources and those values are counterproductive to everyone having justice so if the value is justice yes i'm all in yeah and if i if i could just jump in real quick um i think sometimes when we have conversations we forget that we are a part of the society that we're talking about yeah and so we have an obligate the, the values aren't something just that float out of it i mean every time we show up we should be that representative of that value right. and you know in our own communities in our own spaces um, we need to challenge one another we need to challenge our leadership we need to challenge our institutions to really adhere and fight for and advocate for these these values and principles that we say are dear to us and if we do that um, it, it might not happen overnight, um, you, know, you know, borrowing from, from Paul, you know, one plants, another waters, but we trust God for the increase, that if we will, maybe our, our portion is to plant, and the next generation is the water, but we've got to, we've got to start, and we've got to be consistent with it, and, and hopefully the culture, the society that we live in will ultimately then reflect the values that we say are dear. Leon, just I, and I think we need to that. realize Oh, sorry, Farrell. I was just going to say, Leon, to jump in on that, you you said something that reminded me of the quote in Islam that says that the prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, he was the Quran walking. He carried his values everywhere with him. I appreciate that. And I think just bringing this back to our, our city, back to Baltimore, we have to, I believe, have higher expectations for Baltimore than Baltimore so often is, is faced with. Um, the, the organization um, Let's Thrive Baltimore that I'm a part of originally had the name No One Left Unhelped. And I love that because we don't want to leave anybody unhelped, but we decided to shift, shift it to a thrive and a strength model and call ourselves Let's Thrive Baltimore instead because we can thrive here. 
but we need to do all the, we need to have these conversations, hold ourselves accountable and um, do the work. But I really do believe that it starts with having hope for Baltimore um, and not, not giving up on this incredible, amazing place and all the people in it, um, but believing that we can, we can fulfill the potential that we have here. Thank you so much. I thank each of you for participating um, in, on this panel this evening. I know I certainly learn each time I'm with you. Um, and I thank all of you in the audience for attending. I personally think we ought to have more of these conversations that they should be in schools and in churches and in mosques and in social uh, settings and on social media. But um, I'm really happy that we at least had this conversation here. <laughs>